Hello everyone and welcome. This is a very crucial civic engagement. Happy New Year for those of us uh, that have not seen this year. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is exactly 47 days, 12 hours to the opening of the 2023 presidential election. What a defining moment in the political history of this great nation. In this coming election, more than 90 million people are now registered to vote across 176,846 polling units. 71% of the 12, over 12 million new voter card registrants are young people between the age of 18 and 35. And more than ever, the conversation is rife across platforms and there is no better time to keep the tempo of the engagement on than now. The People's Town Hall is a brainchild of China's television and its partners, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, through the, uh, the Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room, and other partners, and many thanks to them. Some of them are in this room at this moment. Many thanks to you for the work that you are doing for our great nation. So as politicians continue to traverse the length and breadth of the country, it is safe to say that none of the front runners are strangers to the big stage and are also never short of promises, but it is a platform where uh, they not only speak about those ideas and manifestos, but they ask direct questions. We also take the candidates up on specific solutions to the very many challenges confronting this country. And this is a platform. The objective is simple sustain our shared democracy. Tonight, we continue in the series. This time, we're engaging the candidates of the Labour Party and his running mate. Remember, you can follow and send your own questions to the following handles, which you will find on your screen in the course of this program. This two-hour simulcast is bringing to you the best of the ideas that these candidate and his running mate uh, are proffering to Nigerians. Use the hashtag the People's Town Hall. Let's get straight to the business of the day, everyone. I would like to bring on stage the vice presidential candidate of the Labour Party and the former federal lawmaker, Dr. Yusuf Dati Baba Ahmed. <laughs> and with him also um, is a two-time former governor of Anambra State. He calls himself a trader. So he's a businessman. Welcome the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Peter Gregory Obi. <laughs> Thank you so much, indeed, gentlemen, for, for gracing this stage. Thank you so much. Please, you may have your seat. Nigerian people, this is about you, and you have the floor right now. But let's begin, first and foremost, by hearing from the candidates their opening statements, and each of them will have two minutes to tell Nigerians why they deserve your vote on the 25th of February, 2023. I will now begin with the vice presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Dr. Yusuf. Dati Baba Ahmed, your opening statement. Why should Nigerians uh, vote for you and your principal, Mr. Peter Obi? You have two minutes to pitch yourself and your, uh, your, uh, your mandate to the Nigerian people. The day you hear the sentence, President Peter Obi, Nigeria has already united. Once Nigerians are united, we will collectively work towards solving all problems insecurity, failed, failing economy, unprecedented, aggravated corruption. We truly deserve the votes of Nigerians because this is one election that is turning out to be about character backed by record, competence, capacity. This is clearly not supposed to be an election about sentiments of religion and ethnicity, because right now Nigeria is paying a very, very high price. Northern Nigeria is paying 
an extremely high price for voting based on religion and uh, ethnicity. We're going to stop the killings and start the healing. Stop the stealing, start the keeping. Stop the slide of our currency and start the climb of our society. I don't need your two minutes, I'm okay here. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you are a scholar, I know, so um, uh, perhaps why you're speaking poetically this evening. Let me allow the, uh, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party two minutes to pitch yourself to the Nigerian people why you deserve their vote on the 25th of February. Well, thank you for inviting us and thanks the Nigerian audience. For me, if you look at the cumulative, the cumulative effect of leadership failure is what we're suffering today where we have a country that have created the highest number of people living in poverty, the highest out of school children, the highest unemployed youth, the highest drug prevalence in any country that I know. The list of bad news is endless. Just two days ago, I was flying from Enugu to Lagos, and seated beside me was a young girl who was crying uncontrollably, and I was wondering why, and I, I turned. I said, why are you crying? He said, she was kidnapped along with her parents, and the kidnappers have let her go. So she's going to Lagos to beg her uncle to give them money to pay but the, the mother is crying, they are beating the mother. That is Nigeria of today. That is, these are things, I'm just giving you an example that is immediate why I've decided to be part of this race. We want to start turning Nigeria around. We want to start building a nation that starts pulling people out of poverty, start bringing our children back to school, start the healing, like. He said, start creation rather than consumption. That is what we want to do. Oh, interesting. Um, you've won the stage uh, with your opening statement, but I know that uh, I was going to ask you, how is your campaign going? I have things looking up for you and your opinion supporters. It's going very well. Extremely well. You can see it on the street. You can see it anywhere. You can feel it anywhere. No other, can, no other candidates or people who can walk the streets and people will be as excited as they are with us. Everybody wants this new Nigeria. Interesting. Before we get started, I also like to ask Mr. Because I know you did a, a press conference when you were talking about fake news. Some people who um, add fake uh, Twitter accounts in your name and all of that. But it does look like that's uh, that scenario changed a bit, uh, but how is that for you? It really hasn't changed. Really? Yeah, it's on the increase, actually. But I have been able to succeed um, from the last press conference that I held. Um, it has made a huge impact on 2023 elections. Um, it was actually intended to call a particular gentleman to order. And I don't need to repeat all his uh, utterances. And they were taking us on a very dangerous um, di direction. Uh, it was uh, uncivilized, undemocratic, and unpolitical, the way they were attacking our personalities. It was no longer making sense, the kind of politics they wanted to practice. A businessman like Peter Obi, who was uh, very, very excited at the oil opportunity in northern Nigeria, and all they could do was to say that he was against it. This cannot continue. When I joined the ticket, I impeached certain lies against him, and I saw that they were heading towards that. And particularly my good friend on the APC side, you know, on the same level, uh, he was really, really, you know, when people think they have money, they have power, 
and the sitting authority is theirs. There is no limit. Someone has to tap them on the shoulder. I did it and I pointed a finger. You do it again. Do one, I'll do three. You know I'm capable of doing it. And uh, they've stopped. However, you know, uh, me and my family have been paying a huge price for, um, you know, my attempts to save Nigeria, to rescue Nigeria. They sent all sorts of people after me. I would have been a lot happier if only they stopped at me as an individual. But, you know, the thing that I was able to sort with the presidential and vice presidential candidate, I ended up suffering from a much lesser uh, level, uh, 35 years ago at least. Um, our dad of blessed memory passed away. No one ever insulted him until I joined elections for presidency. This is not fair. No one ever insulted. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. You don't insult people's parents or their families. It doesn't happen. It's a huge price for anyone to pay. To insult anybody. Sorry about that. I know it's a bit emotional. Um, sorry about that. Let's get to the very first segment of the conversation, and it's about security. Uh, one of Nigeria's foremost security consultant is the first that will shoot to, for us tonight his question. I'd like to I bring to the microphone uh, Mr. Kabiru Adamu. Um, Your Excellencies, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, these questions are derived from your immensely articulate OB slash Ahmed Baba pact with Nigeria, creating a new Nigeria, it is possible. Um, that, I went through that document and I must commend you for the work you put in making that document available. I have three questions. Um, the first one, you were silent on the correlation between climate change and insecurity. Kindly comment on this given that climate change and the inability of government to implement adapt adaptive measures is likely to continue to drive insecurity in Nigeria, uh, the Sahel, as well as glo globally, and this will, of course, impact Nigeria. Um, question number two. I, I think they should take that first, then we can come to that second one. Okay. Okay. All right. Do you want to take that question? Well, you know, on issue of climate change, I've said strictly that we'll follow the protocols and where we think it is difficult for us to follow, we'll discuss it. But there's already set protocols. You're not, it's not something you adopt what you want or what you don't want. There's a set protocols that we agreed globally and I will follow it religiously. And then where there's issues, we'll discuss it. And that's where I stopped in issue of climate change. I don't want to go beyond that. Okay. Thank you, Excellency. Um, question number two. Um, you imply that good governance will address insurgency and secessionist agitations in the country in the long term. But what is your stand on these issues? And what would you do in the short term to contain them? Well, like I said, in the short term, the issue of insurgency and uh, whether it's the agitation and everything, is to sit down and discuss with them. We're in a democratic dispensation. You govern by discussing, you govern by consensus, you govern by. So I will sit down and discuss with every agitator, without the exception of them. We must use carrot and stick. I will discuss with those who want to change. I'm convinced that when they have reasons, you have to look at what is causing agitation today. It's issues of injustice, issues that to do with that, where there's the void of fairness, issues to do with unemployment, poverty, everything. When you start addressing these issues and you engage them in a discussion, you start bringing them to the table. No agitator globally we have seen reason a convincing argument that things are going the way it should be will continue to agitate because they're agitating for something. We all have agitators around us. 
my children, everybody agitates. But we sit down and discuss it. And when they see reason, they agree with me. But to think that you can continue with this injustice, continue with this unfairness, continue with this level of poverty, unemployment, and young people not knowing where the next meal will come from, you're going to have a crisis in your hand. What about those cases that are in court based on um, failure of uh, conversations? Yeah, you haven't come, that's what I'm saying. You know, you should you be president? Everybody. I'll discuss with everybody, even if you're in prison. The point I'm, I'm making you, is that... It, even, it, if you have been, even if you have been jailed, I'll bring you out and we'll discuss. Because you don't... There are things you don't end up... Only, unless after discussion, as I say, carrot and stick, we must exhaust reason before we apply stick. It is important. This is a democratic dispensation. You don't get up and just give orders. I won't do that. I will govern by rule of law. I will govern by, say it again, sitting down and discussing with everybody. Does that include uh, the Jamaat al Ali bin Ali Dawat al Jihad in the Northeast and the indigenous people of Biafra? I have to find out who they are. Once you tell me it is, if it's you, I'll come to you. I have the exhaust reason. Once I know, once you can identify who you are, I'll discuss with you. No matter how, what you're doing, no matter the type of gun you're carrying, I'll discuss with you. It is after discussing with you that I'll now say there's one government because I've been charged. But we must discuss with you first. Thank you, Eklefti. Number three, what is your view on security sector governance and how will you handle this if you emerge as president but you are not in control of the parliament? Well, I think the parliament is uh, there too are insecure. Nobody is safe. Not as if they live in a different country. So I don't think there will be a problem. They are kidnapping senators, they are kidnapping uh, legislators, they are kidnapping uh, president and everybody doesn't mean to kidnap the president now. Everybody's at risk. Governors are running for cover. So we will all sit down because we are now, anarchy consumes everybody. If they throw a bomb here, it will not spare any of us. Nobody knows who you might take me and share before the people who came to watch us. <laughs> so it's important that we start. So when is a problem, it's a problem for everybody. I'm going to sit down and they will see reason in what I'm doing. It is not going to be a government where even the citizens, I'm going to bring both state actors and non-state actors alike together and make everybody the citizen why we should save the country and build a better country for all of us, our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Excellency. Um, the question on security sector governance, um, what's your view on that? Well. Let me hear your clarification a bit more of what you, because you said you read my documents. Yeah, but you were silent on security sector governance. In other words, um, there are, I think, about 27 security departments in the country. Part of the challenge at the moment is that they are, they are not working together. Bringing them together. And Coordination is there. Ensuring accountability. I said, I said we will bring them together, make them work as one, ensuring accountability, ensuring effective service and making sure they are responsive and making sure that there's a clear authority. And if there's any failure, deal with it decisively. Thank you, Excellency. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Adamo. There is another security expert uh, who uh, is going to be asking questions. Uh, he's abroad. He's Indu Unwokolo of next year. Uh, Mr. Undu, your question. My name is Dr. Ndo Mwokono. I'm a partner with Nestia. Okay. Nestia is an international multi-competency development firm based here in Nigeria with offices across the world. So these are my questions, and I, I wish that you help Nigerians to understand how you're going to solve our security and safety challenges if you become Nigerian president. First, defense and security sector got the biggest budget allocation in 2023 financial budget, which is 13.4% of the total budget, or 2.98 trillion naira. 
While we acknowledge the rising insecurity and the need to improve safety and security of citizens, there have been established relationship between militaries and defense procurement, as well as corruption in Nigeria. And while the military is, on, is underperforming, we have been pointing fingers at how procurement issues have been carried out in the time past. If you become Nigerian president come May 2023, how would you handle the close nature of procurement in the military and defense sector? B, what significant steps would you be taking for Nigeria to reduce our spending on arms? Second question. According to Nestia Violent Database, between January and December 2022, about 3,032 Nigerians, or people who live in Nigeria, were victims of kidnapping. Considering the effort your government made at fighting such issues in Anambra State when you were governor, what would be your practical steps as a government in the war against kidnapping in Nigeria? This is because, judging from the way kidnapping is done in Nigeria, each region has a, procure, a, has a uniqueness of its kidnapping challenge, and this needs to be solved. Policing, second-tier policing, which will be different from the federal government policing. Also. Well, let me start with the first thing, instead of our procurement. If I understand the question clearly, every procurement, be it in the military or in any other sector, will be transparent. We can no longer allow the military or anybody to operate in a, in a different world because we don't have resources. So we're not going to have resources that people can use to do procurement at their own terms. All procurement must be transparent, and more Nigerians it must be transparent, visible, measurable, and we must get value for that procurement. You know, we must be sure that this thing will bring is a value added to it. And I assure you that nothing will be under the table, it will be open. On each of what we are going to do to stop kidnapping and everything is that we need to go out to the root of it. We need to involve communities in securing our country. We need to involve communities in securing our country. i give an example, and I'm sure somebody who is here knew what, a little bit of what I did in Anambra State. We said, listen, this thing starts from the security, from the communities. I invited every single community. We had about 180 communities in Anambra State said each of you must set up a security outfit paid directly by government from my office. I paid them. Each paid directly by government, but all of them a pickup, security pickup, other equipment that was necessary. Told the traditional ruler and is this thing that I hold you responsible if anything goes wrong in your community. If anything goes wrong in this community, we hold you responsible. And we have 180 communities where we have a telephone line connected and everything. If you do anything in one community, within five minutes, everybody has received the message and everything. If you have, and then moved on from community, went to local government, the state working with approved federal agencies, and it became clear within a period of less than one year, the difference was clear. We can do the same thing nationally. There's no reason why we should not have local government policing, state policing, and of course, national policing. Um, enshrined in the law. The Constitution does not recognize that. How yes. would you achieve that? 
I just told you what I did without the constitution. We have to start somewhere before we amend the constitution because we can't wait for the constitution until all of us are kidnapped. We can do this. Forget about what we. I'm not saying it won't come into the constitution. If I go and do vigilante in the village, you don't need constitution to start because people have to secure the people that will make the constitution. Otherwise, they won't even be alive to make, change the constitution. We have to be alive for the constitution to be changed. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. Using my position as the president today, I will sign. If there's, a, there's some powers for the president, it's not everything that he has to wait. I have to secure the people first. Then we amend the constitution to suit it. Uh, would you be considering the 2014 confab and tinkering with it? Well, that one will come. First is that I must secure the people. <laughs> Everybody will be alive, including the president. Then we talk about where, what we are going to implement. Oh, I'm right. not going to wait for anything. <laughs> Nigeria must be secured, and it must be secured as quickly as possible. Whatever oh. it takes. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Baba Ahmed wants to say something. In 2018, I submitted that uh, procurement, misprocurement uh, or inefficient procurement is responsible for an estimated 65% of the quantum of corruption in Nigeria. This question from uh, the gentleman simply confirms uh, my submission. His Excellency, uh, Governor Peter Obi, has given a very powerful argument that the moment you have a leader who is not stealing and the people can see he and his people are not stealing, nobody will be mad enough to steal. So you need somebody who is content. That is already an action taken. Content by his lifestyle, content by his achievements, that the only thing he wants to achieve now is to secure Nigeria. And no contract is going to be inflated. Be it security, be it defense, be it policing whatsoever, Successive Nigeria regimes have under-procured the development of Nigeria. That is why we are so weak. Our security is so poor. If we spend 10 trillion on security, we need to extract 10 or even 11 trillion naira worth of security service, security goods, security um, gadgets in everything we do. Apply that to the world of education. Why is it that a gentleman will get a fresh university started at 1.75 billion in, 19, in 2011, while another government is starting with 10 billion naira in a secondary school? The moment you have leaders that really, really mean business, immediately, everything will be procured with the deserved um, efficiency. Because security you talk about is a product service, product dash service. You are buying it. So you buy the right thing, the right price. And what we're saying is that we have the records, we have the capacity and attitudes to buy everything for Nigeria. The best thing any leader can give Nigeria today is to remove his personal group and political interest. Hmm. We're ready to do that. All right. If you remove that, all of Nigerian procurement is going to deliver the service you, you require. And remember, out of one, over 1,000 uh, members that have been to the National Assembly, I challenge everybody with modesty, go and verify. I am the only sponsor of the uh, prohibition of inflated government contract bill, 2004. Colleagues are here to verify. I, I, I was behind when I was managing director of base research. I was behind what they now call due process. It was called clean contract certification, proposed to the then federal government, brand new federal government in, 20, in 1999. And then it was watered down, it became due process, which became another layer. Every ministry have their own and they just added costs. We are going to uh, either one of two. We lower the amount we're spending on everything for that particular quality and quantity. Be it roads, if we're spending 10 billion naira on 
100 kilometers of, uh, of road, and it is 90% inflated. So you either give us nine times that length of road at the same quality, or you give us back our 90%. All right. Uh, a lot of Nigerians and, and, are and, already... Yeah. And then so, we will... Sorry, last. And then we will pay Nigerians more. We will spend more on education and healthcare and on uniting Nigeria. Mm. This is no-brainer. It's not rocket science. I've been saying it for four years. All right. Um, there, there are a few questions that Nigerians are already asking. I'd like you to, uh, we'll go on a short break, but when we come back, I'd like you to respond to those questions and we'll move into economy. Sarah and Yamoko Felix on uh, Facebook is asking a question. I'd like you to just take a look. But when we come back from the break, you'll be able to respond to these questions. There are several other questions also on Twitter and several other platforms where people are watching and participating. Hashtag the People Star Hall. Everyone stay with us. The People Star Hall continue with Peter Obi and Dr. Baba Ahmed. When we return, we'll be responding or uh, getting the response of both men on these questions on social media, on security, and then we go to economy. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. And the people who stand here live on channels television, Mr. Peter will be the presidential candidate of the Labour Party and his running mate, Senator Yusuf Dati Babahamad. Both of them are on the stage answering questions from Nigerians. This is a different town hall in the sense that Nigerian people are the ones engaging the candidates themselves. Let's get some questions now from the social media. This one is from Facebook and is from Sarah Inyamoko Felix in Nigeria. And, and she's saying, please, Mr. Obi should rightly tell us what plans he has for the men on uniform, in bracket, our security agents and their families, especially those who have lost their loved ones to insurgency and those who still dedicate their lives to this fight. Well, first and foremost is to ensure that they are rightly motivated and encouraged and that we go a long way in ensuring that one, they are properly insured and if anything goes wrong, the, that we give them compassion, compassion as a society by being part and then looking after their families. We must motivate them to be able to take risk for the country. We have had a case of where recently I was telling somebody that I'm looking for phone numbers of police people that lost their lives so I can call their families, visit them, or things like that. When I was governor, people can tell you about what I was able to do for the, to the police people and had even ordinary accidents. We need to show them, support them, let them feel that they're part of the our society, they're cared by Nigeria. Um, there are a few other questions coming from Facebook, but let me go to Twitter now. Uh, this is from Josie at uh, Call Me Josie. Uh, this is quite a sensitive question. And the, the question is asking, it says, tribal militia men are overtaking militants in southern Kaduna, Benue, Niger, Plateau, and recently Enugu State, and settling in their ancestral lands. How would these government stop the influx of nomadic militia gangs in these rural areas? They are part of what we intend to, again, discuss. It's not something that I went to in, uh, on 25th of December. I spent my Christmas with people in IDP camping in Benue. I listened to them. And I told them that if I'm the president of this country, I will take your issue personal. 
Because as long as you're in IDP camp, Nigeria is in IDP camp, no Nigerian will leave his ancestral land to live in a camp in Nigeria and will say, we have a country. So we are going to sit down to discuss with them and the invaders, if they are. It's something that I will be open to discuss and arrive at, again, an agreement that will make each of them to live peacefully. Let's go to uh, the economy now. Um, the National Association of Traders, they are represented here, and they, they will ask him question. Please go ahead, introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ijoma Anuforo, representing the National Association of Nigerian Traders. Good evening, His Excellency. Good evening, Dr. Ahmed. Um, we want to ask, as traders, we have noted your plan to move um, Nigeria from a consumption-based economy to a production-centered economy, and it will require some import substitution, I'm sure. It's a tough process. It will take, you know, it takes tough decisions and um, serious willpower to do that. According to Nas the National Bureau of Statistics, already 130 million Nigerians are living in poverty. This will require tightening our belts, according to the stop uh, Structural Adjustment Program of the 80s and all. What plans do you have to make sure that the already worn out populace are not cast into more hardship, especially in the short run, when you start taking these decisions? Thank you. Thank you so much. I, maybe I need more clarification. I'm a trader myself. I don't think it will require what you say, that it will require more tightening of belts, it will require impost substitution and everything. Yeah, okay, let me give you an example of, we can look at the issues where, when we talk about moving Nigeria from consumption to production. There's no reason why we should be talking about hunger today, when we have vast land, uncultivated land all over the place. That will not stop any or affect any form of importation. You know, if we, if we stop importing food, and everything, you're going to pull more people out of poverty. Because if you go, like states that I've used, for example, if you look at the poor states of Nigeria today, Niger is there. Niger has vast uncultivated land. If by cultivating it, you're going to employ, pull more people out of poverty, more people will be employed, and by the time you start value added, which is what I'm talking about, when that value added and that will even add to export. I don't see why you're going to, what you're saying will apply. Oh, okay, uh, let's take uh, an economist, uh, Dr. Paul Alaje, uh, who is uh, sending in this question from Lagos. Your Excellency, there is no economy without energy. There is no economy Between 2016 to 2022, Nigerians are now paying more for energy. Even before Putin occupied Ukraine, the power of electricity significantly increased. The cost of PMS has also increased. What are you going to do to help Nigeria? In President Obasanjo started intervention in power sector. President Obasanjo started intervention in power sector. President Yara Dua. President Jonathan and now President Buhari, they all have tried their bit, but power seems to be stubborn. How do you intend to overcome darkness in Nigeria and once and for all give Nigeria stable power supply? Are you going to cancel the existing contract with the discos and jenkos? Or what exactly are you going to do to make industry produce more, to improve unemployment and to make power available for homes for all Nigerians? Your Excellencies, in 2015, question. this power issue is at the center of our economy. We get it right, we get a lot of things right. I'd like you to tackle the issue of power. What would you do? Well, let me reply what Paul, what Paul said first. He said he's stubborn. I don't think the power is stubborn. It is the people who are trying to solve it that are not doing the right things. 
We're not the only country that has power problem. People have sourced it everywhere. It's not a, this is not a rocket science. It's been done in several countries of the world. So why is our own different? Yes, there have been issues where we we'll say that the privatization of the process which was started or completed did not go well, but we're not going to revisit or cancel existing positions. No. We are going to make it work. What do we need to do in power is to unbundle first the transmission line. Because today we are actually generating up to 10,000. But the transmission line cannot carry that support the digital, we're going to support the Jenkos who are existing, unbundle the transmission line, support the discos to make sure that at least whatever is produced is willed and distributed accordingly. That is the first thing you're going to do. And you have to do this strictly under a guideline properly supervised. Then you have to open up like South Africa has done. They have power issues like us. Even when they're 60 million and they're generating almost 40 something thousand, they declared the emergency and said, if anybody can generate up to 100 megawatts without license, if somebody with 60 million generating 40 something thousand, almost 50 thousand, declare the emergency, who declare war here on power? I see how. If you will consume everybody, you will consume us. But we must get power. You were in Egypt. <clears throat> what did you learn when you went there? Of course, it's a very easy thing. Egypt did the same thing. Egypt had below about 20,000. They found that if from Arab Springs, one of their studies showed that power is a critical issue. Today, Egypt is generating almost 50,000. In fact, Egypt is exporting power to Europe. If the existence can be done around us, South Africa, Egypt, why not Nigeria? Practically, Mr. Obi, should you win this election on, in February, in practical terms, how much of power do you estimate that you'll be able to give Nigerians, say, after two years of being in office? Go ahead, read my manifesto. Speaking? Is there? Can you tell Nigerians it's who have not read it? It's committed. No, no, no. They need to be reading as well. No, you know, I, since I, you I, have no, the platform, no, you can have When, when I didn't them. present it, they said my manifesto is all they want. Now that I've presented, you should read it. Now you have, the, you have the opportunity. This is the people's town hall. It's said, for the people of Nigeria. I said within four years, first four years, would be able to generate this tribute, not less than 20,000. But I can tell you we're going to do far more than that. It's going to be war. We're not going to, like the first presidential candidate have said, two of us are coming from a different, this is going to be a generational change. We are going to show Nigeria what they've never seen before. We have something to say about the issue of power because I'm going to bring another interesting issue uh, from the question from uh, the second question from Paul Alaje. Nigeria should not be afraid to spend if you are spending correctly and you are going to get value. And this is a national attitudinal uh, revolution we have to adopt. If you scare your government to think that the moment you touch some economic fundamentals, uh, you are going against the people, that economic doctrine has given way to value chain uh, processes. Um, I used to say that why buy fuel cheap and buy security more expensive? Nigerians, so long as the, uh, the domestic demand that will be engendered from the injection of money by a new government that is able to save from waste, a new government that is able to engender investment, okay? So long as the marginal increase after marginal increase uh, is going to bring you to a level that you are paying the realistic commercial level price for either energy or electricity, then 
Nigerians should develop this attitude of accepting and reasoning with their government. Because a government does not operate in vacuum. We need to let Nigerians know well ahead of time that this revolution coming, your understanding and your participation is it, actually. There is nothing that can be achieved without the right. willing participation of the people. And then the pricing is what matters. Economist. We have to understand the era has been changing. There was an era in which it was taken for granted that electricity must come cheap. Then to an era that government will now be adjusting it depending on, then to a level in which they have to pay the commercial rate. Now, what is the commercial rate? If the commercial rate is high, the country must be brave enough to pay it because if the people use all sorts of arguments to refuse to pay, then you have a problem. It will uh, not work and government will have to continue to subsidize. Let's uh, listen to yet another question. This one, I guess, is on inflation from Dr. Alaje, the economist. Your Excellencies, in 2015, when the incumbent administration began, exchange rates at official window was less than 200 naira, and at parallel market, it was around 400 naira. Today, exchange rate is worse off. We now have over 450 at official window and over 720 at parallel market. This has implication on inflation, it has implication on poverty, hunger, and deprivation. And more importantly, the debt management office revealed uh, around the first quarter of 2021 that over a trillion naira added to, was added to our debt profile simply because the central bank of Nigeria devalued naira. If you were the president of Nigeria, how do you intend to help Nigeria with a stable exchange rate? What are the practical steps? What would you do so that the naira in Nigeria's pocket will not continue to go worse off? All right. Paul, well, and you know that the only thing that drives exchange rate is your reserve, and your reserve is as a function of your export. When you're not producing anything and you're not exporting anything, there's no way you can control that. You just have to move into production. I just have to move into production. I've given this example all over the place. You can have a country like Nigeria with 200 million people living on 926,000 square kilometers of land. Our total export, Paul, you know, in 2021, is 18.9 trillion naira. If you use that, the exchange rate on the average, 400 and 700, you see 50 of the average pricing. It's about $30 billion annually if you, if, you, if you have it, if you're able to get out the receipt. $30 billion for a huge country like this. Compares with Vietnam, half of our population at 100 million, living on 331,000 square kilometers, a third of our land. Their total export last year, or 2021, is over 350 billion. And they all manufactured and produced goods. We did, including oil, 31, 30 billion. They did include in a loan, 30 something billion. So we need to start producing and exporting. Two, oil, which ordinarily is your main source of foreign exchange income, is not being stolen. You are the only open country, apart from Venezuela, that could not meet your quota because people in government are stealing the oil. So it is a mess. You need to deal with all this. Otherwise, go and look at what happened in Angola. Angola was able, because of Ukraine war and the oil price went up, Angola was able to bring down their inflation, bring down their rate of exchange. Go and see what they improved. It was almost, it was almost twice what it is today in Angola. But because our own, we have not the, not the oil to sell, what we sold was stolen and everything. And you have to control your financial rascality. If this, what is inflation, inflation in Nigeria today? Paul, you know that. One is the, 
It's the biggest is food insecurity, which is fueled by insecurity. That's fuel, the biggest inflation we have today is fuel infl uh, food inflation. That is fueled by insecurity. Followed with the fact that you have a problem with your exchange rate because you're no longer getting all your receipts. And then, of course, the financial rascality, you're throwing money in an unproductive space. Look at your level of your money supply. It's about four times your productive supply. Your GDP grew by, in the last quarter of 2022 by 2.25%, but your money supply grew by 11%. So that means you're throwing more money in an unproductive sector. So we need to put production, production, production. we we'll start solving that problem. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. And once you start doing it, you have to make these two rates. We must not continue this uh, criminal rate of ex exchange. Yeah, uh, Mr. Obi, uh, the Manufacturer Association representative is in the room. But there is something I would like to clear, and just, this is a very quick one. There is a lot of blame game around on the issue of the fiscal part of the economy, the policies of the CBN. Who would you blame for that? Well, I blame the fiscal side. You know, often a time we blame those who are working when we should blame those who are in charge. I had a situation in Nigeria that I say it very often. There was a, 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 an agency in Nigeria that was, but this was about 20, 30 years ago. I was involved in a probe. They bought a house. This agency bought a property in United Kingdom. 400, that property is supposed to be 400,000 pounds. But this agency paid 2.4 million pounds. Because this is a property I know, and I, I knew where at the, that the environment, that there's no way a property can cost that much. Because, of course, it's not here that people can do anything. If you Google in London and say, property in this area, they showed me. So I decided I must see to the eight. In the end, it was clear that there was a directive from a big man who told a young person to pay that price and say that this, that is the price? So the question became, should we sack this person who opens it for fear of his job, was doing what the young man said, or do we deal with the big man? Everybody said we deal with you. I said, no, you can't deal with him. He was just merely obeying orders. And in Nigeria, when you don't know where the next thing will come from, you probably do certain things that you would not do, utterly not do, where you know where the next meal come from. And when I confronted the man, he told me, he said, as I thought this man is giving him this order, his wife was, this happened to him, this happened to him, and if he doesn't obey, they bundle him back. And then his children was all going to school. So as far as he's concerned, even if he wants 10 times that, he'll do it. So I'm not, I'm not holding, I'm not holding fault for doing the wrong thing, but let's go to the source. That's why I, that he said, if you don't do the wrong thing, those below will not do it. So, I mean, and I've done it in another so if, if you win the election, the CBN structure as it is today, would you leave it or would you do something about it? Don't worry what I'll do. Be less assured that I'll do the right thing. <laughs> All right. Quickly, uh, because the manufacturer uh, association is. I'm right. not giving a different position to Mr. President in waiting. I'm only adding. You said who would he blame? We should blame the head. We should blame the president. That's what uh, His Excellency Peter Abia has been saying. Hold us responsible for anything that happens. In the first 16 years of this democracy, they had the patience to award contracts, even if they were inflated, and be following up and be collecting. Here come the last eight years of our democracy. They were so pressed for 12 years while they were looking for power. So pressed that they had no time to wait for the contracts to be awarded if it is roads or bridges. They just wanted cash the next day. That aggravated the actions in CBN. The very, very wide gap 
that the doctor uh, economist spoke about. That also informed quick cash, like when there was COVID palliatives, that cash of billions had to go and be changed. And you know this cash is not being given into it's directly converted into cash. So there became an error. I said an error, I didn't say government too. I'm not criticizing anybody. There came an era in which they became more and more impatient for quick cash. That was responsible largely for the very sharp increase. Well, you know, like I always say, we've been keeping the records. After the first wave of COVID, when government say, uh, tried to soften the seat at home, go and study how the dollar jumped from 365 to 485. Find out what happened in Zone 4. Find out what happened to the BDCs all around. These things are there for anybody to verify. In summary, we have suffered the consequences of some people's burning desire to get rich quickly. And the easiest way was manipulation of exchange, which already, Mr. President in waiting has already said they are going to be merged. No brainer. No brainer. All right. Why should people go into risks and long-term investments to make a tiny percentage of what families and friends of the powers that be will make between Wednesday and Saturday when the CBN gives out exchange rate? And these are people who came out to say that everybody who ruled in Nigeria before them was a thief. They came out to be greater, you know, in, in quotes, what they call others, than those. All right. Let, let's ask, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, people will be wondering, uh, really thinking about what you said, what you do about the CBN, and uh, maybe somehow that will uh, spill out in the course of, the, of today's town hall. Uh, let's listen to the, uh, the representative of the Manufacturers Association. Your Excellencies. Kyrie Alunga is my name, representing the Manufacturer Association of Nigeria. I've listened with uh, great excitement, times without number, the promise to move Nigeria lightly from consumption to production. And I would like to ask a question about uh, port infrastructure, efficient port infrastructure and services. There's a strategic relationship between ports import and export. You have touched deeply on it tonight. With what we have today, a country of about 200 million population, with a far bigger economic potential than Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, Kenya, Egypt, Morocco, uh, we have you know, a port um, inefficiency that is crippling the performance of our economy. If elected president come 2023, what would you do differently to improve efficiency of our port infrastructure and services? Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And, uh, and you know that 20 years ago, the biggest port in terms of operation, the busiest was Singapore. In 20 years, Singapore have moved from number one to about number four or five today. Because the port of Shanghai, other ports have come up, three have come up in China. Even Rotterdam, that used to be the biggest, the few have all gone. So these things change as quickly as possible. The reason why you still have the inefficiency kind eh, is that people live off that inefficiency. We're going to remove them. There's nothing in it. Post authority is something I followed. Are you aware that Nigerian Post Authority is the only port that I know in the world that have office outside its country of operation? They have office in London. They even have guest house in London. Can you believe it? For running a port in Nigeria. We're going to dismantle this confusion and get the country to work. That's what we're going to do. It's simple. There's nothing, there's nothing, it's not a rock. I keep saying it's not a rocket science. It's been done. People have to do the right thing. Port is not difficult. 
Nigeria is lucky that we have ports all over the place. All, all these oceans you see are ports. What is happening to a bomb? What is happening to look at the Podakot uh, ocean terminal that started by Shagari? See today, it's not functioning to how it should. Look at Wari. There's so many places everywhere in Nigeria is port. And you cannot just open it up. Because but people deliberately don't want it to be opened up because if it opens up, they won't have the confusion. And that's what is happening everywhere in Nigeria. They don't want to open up the economy where people's talent and hard work will match up the opportunity because they will not have anything to steal. How would you change it? What would you do specifically to turn that around, to change that scenario? It's really bring private sector to build ports and manage it. That's what is happening everywhere in collaboration with the government. Mm -hmm. Singapore lives all, only off ports. I can tell you people who live off ports everywhere except Nigeria. All right. Claudia, hi. Hi. Go ahead. Good evening, Your Excellencies. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gloria Sien. I represent the Nigerian Union of Journalists. Sir, our question has to do with the issue of removal of fuel subsidy. Considering that this current administration has said that by June 2023, the subsidy will be removed, is it going to be your priority in your first 100 days in office? How, and how sustainable is subsidy to the Nigerian economy? Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Well, they have removed it. That's what they've done. But I can assure you, it will go immediately. Subsidy, I've said it before, is organized crime. And I cannot allow it to stay a day longer. What they're telling you is not what it is. Half of the, half of the subsidy that's been, half of the, what has been mentioned is not subsidy. First is that, we consume the quantity that is not supposed to be consumed here. We are the same population with Pakistan. They consume below 50% of what we consume. So first, the first half, I will remove it and give those people who are drinking it water. Because that's what they're supposed to drink. So we can save the money. Two, we will deal with the other remaining issue. We need the money today with our debt. We need the money to be able to engage, invest in a critical social development issues. Look at this year's budget. This year's budget, education, which is the highest since this government came, is about two trillion. Health, which is the highest since this government came, is about 1.5 trillion. Then infrastructure, which is road and everything, is about one trillion. So these three critical development areas is receiving 4.5 trillion. Subsidy is 3.6 six, trillion. Six, six no, half yeah. year. Oh, oh like, okay. Half year, six point, three point six. So every full year is about seven trillion. Which country will invest more in subsidy than education and health and even roads? It doesn't make sense. This is the annual budget of education, is two trillion. Annual budget of health is one point five. Road infrastructure one, and subsidy half year is three point six. It will go immediately. All right. Maybe this uh, question, uh, the vice presidential candidate will, will tackle it. Uh, Latasha Ungube is on the microphone. Latasha, hi. Good evening, Your Excellency, Mr. Obi, Mr. Dati. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a lifestyle entertainment, human interest writer and editor, as well as a social political analyst. Aside from my ever-growing concerns about the redistribution of wealth amongst the youth, job security, home ownership, and so on, I would like to focus on the one area Nigerian youths have distinguished themselves and promoted the country in spite of its many setbacks. The entertainment industry has grown in leaps and bounds, with many international players moving in to cash in on our talent and creating millions of dollars and taking it away. What plans do you have when you're elected or if you are elected to scale the industry, create structure and bring in everything we can and build Nigerian youths? Thank you. 
Thank you so much. That's a, that's a, a very double barrier in every sense. Youth oriented and the economy also. Before I answer, let me once again appreciate uh, the contribution of Nigerian youth in bringing Nigeria out to the world and uh, actually adding so much value to our GDP. You see the bedrock, education. If we raise the value, the quality of education that we give out, it will from inside the industry improve their work ethics and deliverables. The second thing is from the side of the economy. We have been speaking about boosting the disposable income of Nigerian families so that there's a little more room to consume on entertainment. I mean to spend on entertainment. And that is a huge boost that uh, we can give to the industry. The rest are all tied to what Mr. President in waiting and what, what we've been discussing here. Power, security, an economy with all requisite infrastructure. Then of course, by the time we are able to pass that message out that security in Nigeria has drastically improved. We will move a step forward to link Nigerian movie industry, Nollywood, with international movie centers. And by the way, it has pained us a lot during this uh, World Cup season to sit and watch without Nigeria. Uh, when African Cup comes up next, like I said I would do with uh, ASU, I will again plead with Mr. President to who is whoever is in charge of sports and youth development. Ensure that all is done. We move mountains to bring African Cup to Nigeria. There is no way World Cup will be played without Nigeria. Nigeria has passed that. It will never happen again, by the grace of God. This is entertainment. Sports is entertainment. And Nigerians, and then we're going to proliferate sports. It's infrastructure and the reward coming to the participants. Never will the salaries or allowances of Nigerian players be delayed by one hour. We will be there to ensure they are compensated and compensated over their own compensation. Link them with industries and companies. Raise their profile internationally. Uh, These this are part of what we'll do. Okay. Um, please, if I can just revisit the last question. There is a variety of ways that Nigeria is being shortchanged from what Mr. President has called, uh, you know, the scam is a crime. Time will permit me to only mention only two. You see, when there is a Ponzi scam like the um, subsidy, a very, very small group of super rich who do not consume Nigeria, they don't consume Nigerian food, or anything that adds value or brings the money back. They only take, they exchange the money. By exchanging that money, they are depressing the Naira, which is a loss. And I have argued that any further depreciation in Naira is a direct assault to our national security. Then it is depriving a key area like security. Just imagine injecting, for example, 6.3 trillion on security and not on a scam called subsidy. Just imagine what it will do. And whenever you speak about amounts, look at, for example, if you say five trillion is going to be spent under a system like ours, look at five trillion to be between 30 to 40 trillion. Because right now the five trillion spent 
is giving you only 15 to 20 percent at best of the value of services and products that, and works that you're getting. Once, like I said again, group, personal, and political interests are removed, without increasing any amount, you have increased the value of what you are getting. So when you speak about five trillion now, you're speaking about 30 to 40 trillion during our own time. All right, let's wrap up quickly in just about 60 seconds on the economy, because we see have education, which I'm very, very passionate about. The issue of health is also there. And more importantly, women, the young people, and people living with disabilities, we must tackle those issues tonight. Um, quickly, Mr. Selby, if you want to touch on the issue of subsidy, what would you do with the money? Then also, if you become the next president, if you are elected in February, you will be inheriting a burden of about 70, 77 trillion naira in debt. How would you resolve that? Two things. Let me go to the issue of foreign subsidy again. We have Tango Terrifying almost nearing completion. We will accelerate this completion. We have modular refineries today that have been completed. They can't even get um, crude. Can you believe it in Nigeria? That we have even modular refineries that are completed. They can't get crude. Something that is available all over the place. We are a gas-rich country. We will encourage gas fuel vehicles and as well as again gas consumption in other areas where fuel is needed. Even people they say it's illegal refineries. We will bring them into legality by sitting down because I said I'm going to talk with everybody. So if you're illegal, we will we'll regularize their position, discuss with them, bring them into the purview of what is right. They become of part of what is right. On issue of debt, I said before now several times, there's nothing wrong in borrowing. Every country of the world that I know and I've thought is, is borrowing. But it is what you borrow for that makes the difference. When you borrow for production, it works. When you borrow for consumption, you have a crisis. The crisis we face today show is that we borrowed for consumption. And because of it, we did not see the growth in the value. In 2015, our cumulative debt was about 15 trillion. Today, it's about 75. So we've grown five, it's grown five times the size. So it's now from 15 to 75. We're talking about 400% increase. In 2015, our GDP so was over $500 billion. In fact, our per, per capita in 2015 was 2550 Today, after we have borrowed 400 times, which means our per capita should have been about 1000 now, but it's 2000 So where, what happened to the money we borrowed? It's a very simple thing. If that money was properly invested, there's nothing wrong. How are you going to manage it when you come into office? Because there's a huge debt. We've now moved to where we're owing less than 20% of our GDP to almost 50%. Because if it's 77, at 410, if you add a little, we're going to have $200 billion of debt with a GDP of 450%. What are you going to do? First is that you stop all borrowing. Every borrowing now will be for investment. Two is to discuss with the lenders on how you can now stretch the borrowing to be able to pay and be able to continue growing the country. Leave financing for me. I will know how to handle it. It's my sector. I'm a trader. So I will deal with it. But nobody will ever borrow again. If you're not borrowing for investment, there's nothing wrong in borrowing. And we'll then start saving. 
You see, people are talking about, they have said it, every candidate has said, I'm stingy. They didn't know that investment and saving is development. That's how you develop. The biggest debtor in the world today, in terms of country, that are developed is Japan. Japan is owing over 230% of their GDP. But Japan is the highest holder of US Treasury. Here is that they, what they borrowed is consumed, nothing saved. So we are, we entered one chance. <laughs> Let's go to education. Yeah, this is another very important aspect. Uh, we have the representatives of us. So it's good to see you again. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I'm Ben Ugeoke representing ASU. You spoke about education receiving 8.2% of this year's budget as its funding. And you said a serious country should do that. I believe you. And this is actually the problem we'll be facing. Now, amidst this problem, in the midst of it, there is the proliferation of universities. On the funding of the existing ones, and then proliferation of new ones, with the intention of shifting the funding body to a very poorly paid civil servants and suffering parents. What will be your views on this? And again, Tertiary Education Fund is the biggest intervention fund now for universities. It takes 2% from eligible companies before tax, uh, profit before tax, to run. And it's the biggest intervention now. Would you have the political will and the courage to raise this percentage to about 10% so you can place education or first line charge thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you when so you much, said, When you said raise it to 10% for the companies who are paying, when? how are you going to, you can explain how you want to fund education generally. Well, Thank let you. me tell you, education is not an expense. That's the first thing that I have to come to you. Education is an investment. Because the more your country is educated, the more that your development. So when you see that as an investment, that's why I said to fund social critical development is an investment. So you're going to get more, more out of it. Now, how do you fund education? And how do you fund health? Because these are critical areas. It's first, is a combination of a lot of things. Our universities today is poorly funded and just all the tertiary institution is poorly funded one is that you need to change the method of funding them the country has to contribute the companies you said will continue with the the third fund contribution and then we we'll do a combination of loan system to enable the students pay what is required. We're not going to burden their parents. Every other country that I know, even developing countries, have changed. We're going to learn, so it's going to be a combination of three ways in order to be able to fund tertiary institution properly. And I assure you that we're going to do everything possible to get it. One, there will be no strike again. We are not going to close school for any reason because at a tertiary level, why the global average is at 8%, we are 9%. So we're not going to take chances. And we're going to do so many other ways. So it's not just people being in university. Some of our universities, in Pakistan, there's a university that have almost over one million population. There's no reason why we can't do all those things here. Through all forms of learning today, correspondence, everything, you know, there's so many things they're doing. This will help us to bring more pool into increasing the number of students 
and everything. And luckily for me, he owns a university. So I'm going to say to him, well, listen, if your own is not closed, we can't close the public one. How you do it, you will tell me. But I assure you, nobody will be on strike unless his own is on strike. All right. Let's listen to a medical doctor, because that's another uh, issue right here that we need to tackle. Dr. Henry, it's good to see you. Good evening, Your Excellencies. Good evening, Nigerians. Henry Ogunon is my name. I speak for the Health Sector Reform Coalition. Your Excellency, two things. One about your past and another in the future. For the future, Nigeria is still hovering around 5.3% annual health budget. 2023, 5.3%. Uh, Despite the fact that the Abuja Declaration of 20, 2001 was hosted by Nigeria, how will you improve healthcare financing? Where will you get the money from? Related to that is access to health. You are partisan representatives to our US, US means Universal Health Coverage Day celebration. Two people came to represent you and your party. And we gave them, they gave us the award about improving access so that Nigerians have health promptly when they need it without incurring financial hardship. Today, insurance coverage since 2005 is still less than 7%. What else are you going to do to improve this coverage? Finally, about something that happened in about 2013. Medical and health workers were on, yes. Medical health workers were on strike for 13 months in Anambra State while you superintended as governor. People are finding it difficult to trust you again. Why, what are you going to do to avoid that situation? And why would you have allowed health workers to go on strike, be on strike for 13 months? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very, very good question. I thought you would have said what happened between me and them and how it ended. But let me explain it so that Nigerians will know. Good. They were not the only people who went on strike. The second, the teachers in NUT went on strike for, the, for a long time too. When we came in, things were not working in the health sector. I didn't have one single school of nursing School of Midwifery or Health Technology that was accredited. None of our hospitals, as you know, was accredited. We didn't have one single ambulance. I want you to step on this. So I decided we're going to buy 30 ambulances, one per local government. Then the, the six to move around other places. We're going to invest in it. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We invested the money for two years. No result. What do you want me to do? So I decided, okay, I'm going to partner. Since I know as a, as a young man, Iyenu, which is owned by the Church of Nigeria, produced the first midwife in Nigeria. It's not a God. So I said, go and call me the bishop. I want to this year give this money to a bishop since my own didn't work. Let the bishop resuscitate the school of nursing in Yenu, school of midwifery in Yenu, school of this, and in Yenu hospital. I called the, the uh, Boromir hospital, owned by Kali Church. I want to give you money to go and see all those schools today. In fact, yesterday we were in a in Oshobo, a young girl came and said he graduated from Amich School of Nursing. I said, you brought the girl. He said, it was me who made it possible because I built that school from scratch with the Anglican, with the Church of Nigerian Bishop of Amich. I invested the money through this money. It didn't work. I invested it through. Then they started striking and said, I'm not spending the money. I'm using government money. I'm not going to the financial guideline. I said, which guideline? I put my money in the guideline he missed. So I put it to where they threw out the other way, and it worked. 
So why, how can we? Today, we settled. I paid them for now. But to even tell you what happened, who is my commissioner for health, Ikako? He was one of the striking doctors. He said, no, he cannot strike, that I'm right. I went to the hospital to where he was working. I said, this is your, you refuse to go and strike your commissioner. That's how he became commissioner. He said he won't be. If I say, he ran away. I said, okay, you're commissioner. You who is striking. That is how we're going to get people. I did not. Me and them settled. I don't want to tell you what happened. How are we going to deal with the future? We have a country called Indonesia. There are 265 million people. They are providing health through insurance where poor people are paying little or nothing. The rich people are paying more. That is happening in India where they have 1.4 billion people. The same insurance. We will do it here. We must provide the budget today for health and education is low. Forget this year's budget that was 1.5 trillion. The six year budget for health, and you know, between 2015 and 2021, it's not up to 2.5 trillion. That is unacceptable for a country of 200, 200 million people. Just like what we did in education, this is unacceptable. We're going to ensure that insurance work, and I'm going to supervise health, education, and pulling people out of poverty will take top priority. We're going to do it rightly, but we're going to do it where it works. Just like I told you in health, it happened to us in education. First year, we are number 26 in Waiyaka Neko. Second year, we are number 27 in Waiyaka Neko. And you want me to continue with money? I put the same money to the same channel. In four years, we became number one. That's where to work. If we take go, if we come into office here, we will try to do things in a way that Nigerians will see that their money is transparently applied and they will see the result. I will make sure that I, as number one person, I am. He has a, hospital, a big hospital in his university. We have university hospitals. I went to a university in um, Ekiti. Afebola University, if you see the hospital there, if it means putting money in private ones, I'll put money there. But all of us must be treated here. We're due for a break. But when we come back, the conversation continues. And you are in the context of that conversation because this is all about you, Nigerian people. We take a break, everyone. And when we come, come back, the people's time will continue. With Peter, Gregory Obi, and Yusuf Dati Baba Ahmed of the Labour Party. We'll be right back, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. The People's Town Hall continues. Now we're getting to the very final half of the program tonight. So let's get to it. I know Oluwakwa Kukoyi is standing by um, with our question. Good evening, Your Excellencies. Oh. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Anu from Yaga, Africa, and my question will be on youth inclusion in governments and politics. There are over 4,000 young people contesting in the 2023 general elections. We want to know what your party is doing to support them to win now and in the future election cycles. Then secondly, what will you do to support youth development education, and ensuring investment in the sectors that affect young people if you are elected as president in 2023. Thank you. All right. Well, like I've said before, let me start with the issue of youth inclusion. I don't think I will be supporting them to win election because you know already I'm trying to carry myself to win. So it's a difficult thing to try to support another person. One thing I can assure you is that they will be part of the government we are going to form. A critical plank of our government will be youth and women. But you know, this is a very, you can see I'm struggling. You cannot be carrying, a, 
under weight when you're already in difficulty. Then you cross yourself. But involvement, yes. We need them. It's about their future. They have to be in decision making. I say it every day. And I do it now. You could see in all my visits, in all my trips, I go with youth, I go with women. So it's not, and it's something I've done in the past. I brought young people into government when I served as the governor, and women were in charge. So for me, it is not, I'm not trying to change. In education, I said, the more you invest in education, the better your development. So education, I can assure you, education and health will not receive less than 10% of any budget that I'm part of. We'll make sure that we increase the budget, fund education properly, fund health properly, fund pulling people out of poverty. These are two critical areas that HDI is developed, is hunger, and we must invest in it. All right. Um, Mr. Bera Efendu of Women in Politics, please to add. Thank you very much. Good evening, Your Excellencies. I'm a very friend on the president of Women in Politics Forum. On record from INEC, women represent 50.8% of registered voters. And the percentage of women in governance is abysmally low. We tried to correct it, you know, uh, the last, uh, well, the National Assembly is still on, that's the Ninth National Assembly, by presenting bills to the National Assembly. The five bills were rejected. I want to ask you specifically, what will you be doing to change the status of women in governance, to ensure that women's political participation is equal to our, our votes. Because no politician, I know that as you are going around conversing for votes, women, without us supporting you, you will not get elected. So what specifically will you be doing to ensure that there's increase of women's political participation? Thank you. Thank you. You know, I've always maintained that what we need to do is to look at people's past. Just like somebody came now and said, looking at my past. And I was able to explain the circumstances I found myself that made me to take decision that I took them. Now you ask asking the same question. How will you? In fact, let me tell you, as governor, I was about setting up Ministry of Men Affairs. Because women took over. It's simple. Go and verify, as governor of Anambra State, my chief of staff was a woman. Permanent Secretary Government House, woman. Commissioner for Finance, woman. Accountant General, woman. Head of Service, woman. Commissioner for Youth and Sports, woman. Commissioner for Education, woman, commission, head of, uh, commission for local government. I said, they took over. It was us that was different. And I can say it without anything. Women are more productive in Nigeria than men. <laughs> Any day, any time. I worked with them while I was in the banking industry. They saved the bank. When they believe in anything, they go for it. I wish that men we do the same thing. And they are less corrupt. They are less corrupt. When they, are, they are really satisfied with little. The men will just go on and on, forgetting that it is public money they are taking. I'm very sorry about that, men. I'm one of you, but I have to say the truth <laughs> of what I observed in the whole exercise. So, for me, this government is about women and youth, because they will, we want to change the country. They're not going to look for me. They're not going to, and we're going to, that deal, you said that they, we're going to, we're going to represent them. We're going to revisit it. It's very important. Bangladesh, is, that's how they changed. One of the fastest developing places today is Bangladesh. Prime Minister is a woman. Opposition party leader is a woman, speaker is a woman. You know, when they're there, because they have children, they have families, they want to succeed. 
All right. Yes, we have someone from the National Association of Persons with Disabilities. Please go ahead. Introduce Thank you. yourself. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, and good evening, Nigerians. My name is Ade Tunde Ademefu from the Joint National Association of Persons with Disabilities. I bring you greetings from the National President. Uh, we have two questions. One, Nigeria currently runs an inclusive education policy. And by inclusive education, it means bringing learners with disabilities and learners without disabilities in the same classroom, learning together. And of course, that's a strategic plan in addressing uh, future uh, discriminations. Um, do you believe in inclusive education? If yes, what are the plans that your party has? If no, why? As a follow-up question, um, do you commit uh, to appointing persons with disabilities into critical uh, offices and by critical offices we mean for instance uh, minister for finance uh, budget and planning so uh, besides the offices of a special assistance and uh, of course uh, executive secretary for the national commission thank you well you know here we classify people with disabilities we all have we all have disability these glasses I'm wearing is a form of disability I can assure you that is not just uh, listen. We're going to appoint people. We are not going to look at our consideration. Will be what you are going to offer. There's so many people who probably for one thing or the other, not of their own making, we can say they are physically challenged. Because I don't like using the word disability. Physically challenged. But they are, I've seen some of them that are very very intelligent. Don't forget that I met Steve Hawkins in Oxford. You know, I met Steve Hawkins in Oxford. So, I, I mean, I believe in inclusiveness when it comes to inclusive education. We will make sure that everybody is part of it. Again, if you think there's things you want me to learn more about what you want us to do, I'll be willing to learn it, but I can assure you that we will, in terms of education, we will be inclusive. In terms of all, if there's anything we can go extra to do to make sure that those who are physically challenged are listen, if there's any learning thing, because I won't stay here and tell you I know everything I have to do to satisfy what you want. So if you want, even after this session, come and teach me what you want. I'll learn because the job of a leader is to also learn. A leader doesn't know everything. If you know everything, you're an idiot. You know, I don't know everything. So if there are things you want to teach me, I'm willing to learn. All right. Leading and learning is critical. It's number one thing for a leader. Mr. Maudi is standing by the microphone. Please go ahead. Okay. Good evening, His Excellency, and good evening, everybody. Sir, the patriots in human rights community in order to address Nigerian women exclusion in structures of representation and decision making collaborated with like-minded legislatures and presented a bill on special seats for women, a temporary measure to address Nigerian women historical injustice and discrimination. The bill was rejected. Sir, if you and your vice are elected into office, how, what will you do to address to ensure that bill, that bill is, it becomes law, so that women will have legal framework to ensure they are included. So we know you are a good man, you've done it in the past, but we need it across the country. What will you do differently, sir? I said I'll represent the bill. Yes. And it will be passed under me. Okay. Sir, Nigeria has the highest maternal mortality rate in Africa, and second globally after India, that has over a billion population. What will you do differently? to ensure this maternal mortality rate is reduced drastically. Thank you. Again, that issue is one of those sad things that's happening to us. He said we, we have the second biggest. We are not two. We have overtaken India. No, we have overtaken India in infant mortality. We are expected to overtake them by 2025, but we overtook them in 2022. You know, this, this is the one record where we were faster. We have overtaken India. There's not been seven times our population. What it is, you need to invest in primary health care, starting with the 
human infrastructure. There's no reason why Nigeria should have shortage of human infrastructure in primary health care because I have millions of people that are unemployed. A nurse told me yesterday that he's unemployed in Nigeria. How can that be? It's not possible. You need education because all these women, especially in the north, because the biggest sector that where we have this infant mortality is in the north. Because you have huge population of people you have not paid attention to educate appropriately, support them with the proper health care infrastructure, which is the human infrastructure. It's happening. On the 1st of January this year, I was in IDP camp in Abuja. 6,000 people, they have only one room clinic, only one room. The person working there is a, a freelance, a, a nurse who volunteered. And he told me that if, that if you know the number of women who have died here, or that, they couldn't, that she can't cope, why would that happen? So these are areas to invest and deal with. So uh, a lot of uh, comments have been coming. They wanted to hear from uh, uh, Dr. Baba Ahmed. Uh, a lot of Nigerian doctors have fled the country. And uh, your principal was talk making reference to you as an investor in education and the health sector. Uh, does your um, uh, mandate have a, uh, a strong plan on ensuring that more Nigerians stay and service the health and education sector. The UK alone in 2022 had almost 80,000 Nigeria go for education. Either the one they applied for and their family that went with them. Almost 50,000 of them had uh, um, uh, application that, that they went for education in the UK. That's just one country. So what does your uh, platform or your ticket have as planned in those two areas? I believe in healthy competition. And we're not going to be operating from a point of weakness, um, driven by, by the fact that great changes are about to happen. First of all, um, it is better to have brain drain than to have a brain in the drain. I've been saying this for a very long time. We cannot afford to have educated and trained medical practitioners and others see them go to waste because the system is not working. Right, go ahead, build up a career. When things are okay back in Nigeria, we'll bring you back. Now, the things that are happening, and they're going to happen at the same time, the one there is going to be a positive revolution in Nigeria, it has started, you can see evidently, from the obedient movement. Then there is going to be a revolution in governance itself once we come into power. That is going to have what we call announcement effects. That effect is going to hit the world as a tsunami. You have Nigerians who have lived and worked and retired in the Western world, they now openly admit that quality life is in Nigeria when Nigeria works. We are in touch with them. We have a system that will bring them back even while they are there. We have a system in which they will invest in Nigeria and use Nigerian medical practitioners and other professionals while they are still there in the Western world before they finally relocate to come back. We are again feeding them that come back to your home country, live like a king. Don't slave your life away in that quiet, cold. You have built the profession. You have built the career. Good. Now it's time to come back. So this is what is going to happen. All right. Security in Nigeria has been fixed. Nigerians are secured. Money is going to start flowing in. The government is just and is serving justice. Investment 
is overflowing into Nigeria, then expertise will be following. Then Nigeria's position in the world is not only going to be by population. Nigeria's position in the world will begin to reflect its population and its productivity at the same time. These are the revolutions, these are the movements that are emerging All right. in the next, I can say, 48 years that are happening. This right. is real and present. It is happening now as we speak. There are medical doctors who have succeeded in all that they can succeed. They have the money to bring into Nigeria. All they want is a government that will make Nigeria work. And it's coming. All right. Uh, we've, we're just at that moment. Uh, we'll, we'll listen to your uh, closing thoughts. Uh, we just have about a minute each uh, to close your uh, argument uh, before we close. Finally, but there is a question, uh, Mr. Obi, which uh, we're getting uh, people would like you to comment on. Uh, one of your opponents has described you as a stingy man uh, in one of the campaigns, and that uh, you might find it difficult to get things done with that kind of character. How would you respond to that kind of statement? Well, very simple is that uh, as governor of Anambra State, between the year it's surprised between the year 2000 and year 2015, the only measure of development that is done globally is Millennium Development Goals. This is a standard benchmark. If you check, when I became governor in 2006, we started implementing it in 2008, so we are late by seven years. By the time Nigeria is stopped in 2015, Anambra was number one. And that includes, I was number one in education. This is by, this is by UNDP, not by Nigeria. By UNDP, I was number one in education. By Nigeria and WAYEC, I was number one. I, was, I won the get prize in health. This is again not Nigeria that marked it. So I can go on. I had the best road network in terms of fighting poverty. Go and check, ask Evelyn Oputu. I was the first governor to go to Bank of Industry and say, I want us to do something. I want to put in money here and you support my micro small businesses, which is what the governors are seeing today. I and Evelyn Oputu started that. Then, uh -huh. Go and ask Magnus Parker, who was in charge of poverty alleviation. I was number one. Mr. I'm calling names of people. <laughs> I can go on and on. We're, we're but let me tell you now. about yeah. the, about that issue. It's good that when my opponents talk, let us talk about corruption. Thank you. One of the things that is killing this country today is corruption perception index. And that is measured on how you manage public assets, nepotism, how you share the land, right. how you manage your money and everything. And I've challenged everyone, I just said, go and see whether there's anywhere a couple of Anambra State money is missing. Saving have now become an issue right. when people have stolen all the money and impoverished the country. And you're now questioning a man who's left the money without anybody telling me to leave it and go. Mr. Obi, we'll take that as your closing moment because we're totally out of time. But on behalf of China Salvation Partners, the Situation Room, these are charter of demands, one for you and one for uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Baba Hackman. These are uh, key areas in which the civil society organization want your team to look at and tackle. Well, I must sincerely thank you on behalf of all our partners and everyone who have come to witness this event tonight. Thank you so much indeed, and I wish you the very best in the coming days. It's just for the something days to the election. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed. Well, Nigerians, you've had your voice. You've had your say. You will have the opportunity to make your vote count, and that is going to be on February the 25th. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. On behalf of Channel Television and its partners, it's goodbye from all of us.